Welcome to Quilting's first reality show, live and unscripted with Susan Smith. Hello, hello, and welcome. I'm Susan Smith. You are in my studio, Stitched by Susan. And I do want to say at the beginning here that we are trying some new software today, a new version of our software. So I want to make sure that everyone knows this just in case for some reason we have a hiccup and we have to start afresh. So we're able now to stream on multiple um, platforms. So we're on YouTube and Facebook today. So if anything runs amok and we for some reason get cut off, please know that we are still here and we will be right back. So just wa wherever you're watching, just check back in, maybe refresh your page and we should come right back into play. So that said, this show is called Live and Unscripted because it is streamed in real time. There's no editing. You're going to see the quilting process exactly at the speed that it happens with all the wrinkles and warts um, attached, whatever happens within this project. Today's project is going to be three mini quilts side by side. A little housekeeping before we get into that. Um, I love for you to comment and ask questions as I'm quilting. Every so often I'll take a pause and read those comments and, and answer them if I can. And we'll have some discussion going on. That's the beauty of being on live. You can get those questions answered right away. These live and unscripted episodes are generally aired the first and third Friday of each month. And it's at 9 a.m. Pacific time. Always the same time so that you can find them and know when they're happening. So I encourage you to like and to subscribe. And also if you hit the little notification bell, YouTube will let you know whenever I'm going live too. And that can be really helpful. So I appreciate that. And I would love if you would share this with any of your friends who you think would enjoy this style of quilting. I'm pretty casual about my quilting. A lot of it is freehand and a lot of it is edge to edge work. And I just talk about the process a little as I'm doing it. So it's not lessons per se, but I'm just talking about whatever the decision decisions are that I'm making or the things that I'm doing and why. So if you think you know someone who'd be interested in that type of quilting, I'd love if you would share this, share it on social media, share it via messages or emails any way you like. I would so appreciate that. Also, if you're interested in supporting this show, you can easily do that by going to buymeacoffee.com forward slash stitched by Susan. And Mr. Producer is going to pop that on the screen for you so that you can see. And very easily you can go there and you can make a donation of as little as five dollars or if you wish you can sign up for a monthly contribution all of the funds that come into that go toward upgrading our equipment so we're always trying to level up our cameras or our cordless devices or our routers or whatever the thing may be and if you want proof of that go back and look at some of our earliest episodes and see how far we've come so we do appreciate your support a number of you choose to support every single month and i appreciate it hugely so we just keep using that to keep getting a better and better production and make it more available to you. So buymeacoffee.com forward slash stitched by Susan. Other places that you can find me, um, my website is stitchedbysusan.com. If you want more information um, about my quilting services, I only do edge to edge quilting at this time for customers, but also there you can find information if you're interested in paid classes. So I do have a huge master class. It's six weeks. It's 50 some short lessons all about freehand and edge to edge quilting, kind of taking the mystery out of it, teaching you a series of designs and also teaching my thought processes behind those designs. What makes them flow smoothly or easy to remember? and you know how you move around on a quilt top all that practical stuff so that you can use that as a springboard to your own original designs and work and feel the confidence to do quilting freehand it is what i love to do and i love to show how you can do it too so information on all of those classes is available on my website also i have a podcast if you just would like some light listening and it's called measure twice cut once and to this point it has been interview based so i'm often talking with other quilters or crafters some of the upcoming episodes will be just me so that may change a little but i'm always talking about crafting your sewing room those sorts of things so just some light listening so measure twice cut once you can find that easily at podcast.stitchedbysusan.com okay i think that's all the details if anyone is just tuning in i'll remind you once again we are trying an updated version of our streaming software today which is enabling us to be on both youtube and facebook 
we have run several tests and it has worked beautifully, but just in case something goes amiss today, please just refresh your page and check back. We're still here. We will keep going to the end of the project. We'll come back on if we get cut off, okay? So Mr. Producer has a question here. Okay, I'll try and get this clear. If you're watching on Facebook, and if you're having any trouble there, Dave dropped the link to the YouTube stream into the Facebook page, okay? So if you're watching there and having trouble with the Facebook for some reason, you can also click on that YouTube link and catch it there. Hope that all makes sense. So it's always a bit of trial and error trying out this, this new um, product, but it seems like it's going to be really, really nice to be able to stream in multiple places. Okay, on to today's project. This is from my client, Laura. You've seen her quilts before. She does a lot of scrappy quilts and just some really beautiful and original designs. And she does lovely piecing. Her quilts are always a pleasure to work on. And she gives me permission to quilt them for you anytime. So today's project is going to be three mini quilts. And they're quite mini. You'll see them in a moment. This is the backing for it. And Laura has pieced the three backings together in a row so that I can load them all just once on the long arm. It saves fabric because it takes a little less excess, you know, for the loading process and it sure makes it easier for me to just have to load the one. So again, I'm using my red snapper system. Um, I won't go into it in depth here. If you want to see more of this, you can watch some of the other episodes. Um, but basically, this same red plastic material, there's a little, a little rod running through the hem of my leader and it allows me to clip this snapper on. I am not centering my quilt backing or top at all. I'm just starting at one side and clipping it and you'll see in a moment how that works. I often have a selvage edge running along this first side because it helps me to, to keep the fabric perfectly flat, neither stretched out nor squenched in. In this case, I've got cut edges of all these fabrics. So I'm just being aware of that, that they're smooth, that I'm not pulling too tight and stretching them out nor squenching too much under there. I just want them to be as smooth as I can. So I'm just paying a little bit of attention to that as I load it. And usually I would just toss this backing, you know, over that far rail and then roll it on. But of course this is very short. So I'm going to have to do it a little differently today. And I'm just going to take Laura's markers off of here. Just a little side note, by the way, if you send out quilts to a long armor, it may feel like overkill to have all these pieces of paper, but I tell you what, as a long armor, I appreciate it. Laura marks every piece of backing, every quilt top with her name and address and contact information. You wouldn't believe how easy it is to have 25 quilts sitting in the waiting lineup and not know whose is whose. And you wouldn't believe how many quilts I get that have no identification on them. So I usually put the identification on, but gosh, it's really helpful if you're willing to do it. So for today's purposes, I'm going to give myself some more slack. And this leader, of course, the whole thing went flying, didn't it? Because the leader's heavy. We mentioned live and unscripted, right? see Susan jump. <laughs> so I'm just going to give myself some excess on that leader so that I have something to toss over that back rail. And I might have to manhandle this a little bit because you can see the leader's heavy and it's pushing, but I think I can get it. Let me grab a couple more of my snappers and I'm going to come around to the other side of the machine. And now I'm going to pull my backing smooth and straight. And I'm watching to be sure that it's not pulling to one side or the other. This is how I avoid having to center things. I just make sure that it is straight. The grain of the fabric is straight coming over this rail and now I'm just going to pull it on and pin it in place. And what I'm gonna do, you guys, I don't know if you can see this on camera, but I'm actually gonna put a clip on this leader just so that it doesn't go flopping off again when I start rolling it. I'm not quite sure what will happen, but a little extra safeguard there. Okay, and now I'm just gonna roll that backing just like that. I think I went a little too far already. It's so different when you're doing such a small one. 
I need to make sure that it is extending a little bit beyond the leader on the other side. Oh no, I think it's okay. I'll pull it just a little. I'm not sure which version of the camera you're seeing. But what I'm after is the edge of this backing to extend just a little bit past my leader on this, on the uh, far side, the far rail. And now I'm just snapping my leaders in place here. And Dave is reminding me, when you are asking questions, if you would just put a capital Q in front of them, that is really helpful. Then if we need to search for questions, we can search for a Q and they all come up as separate from, you know, all the other comments, our introductions and so forth at the beginning. Okay, we are now attached. And can you see how well that worked? My backing is smooth, it is straight, and it's ready to go. Okay, batting is the next step. I'm using Hobbs 80-20. It is my favorite all-purpose batting, so the 80% represents the cotton, the 20% is polyester. So you get much the same feel as a cotton batting. You get a little bit of shrinkage like you would with a cotton batting, but the poly gives it a little bit more loft and helps it to resist creasing when you've got your quilts folded and stored. And I put my little minis in order so I get them on the right backing. Have a look at these cute little quilts. And I can see, I don't know that you can on camera, but I'm able to see the outlines of the backing piece for each one so that I'm able to make sure that I'm placing them correctly. The pink and the green are the same piecing design. And look at this little cutie. Um, recently I did a topographical meander um, YouTube episode and it was this same pattern but in a big quilt size so instead of teeny tiny little pieces they were much bigger pieces just double checking that I'm between the seams looks good okay and again see how Laura has nicely labeled all these pieces for me I so appreciate that because then there's never any question in my mind and if there is a top to any of them she marks that that is so so helpful because sometimes you get head down quilting and you just just forget to look okay I think we're ready let's do a couple questions I'm gonna get another sip of coffee going on and then we'll get at it Shelby I'd love to hear more about the quilt on the wall if you'd like to share it's lovely okay remind me I'll come back to that in just a minute once I get quilting and then I can talk a little bit Joan, can Susan accommodate a king size quilt for a customer? I have a customer th with a king size top. I can only go up to queen size. Yes, I can. Feel free to reach out to me, Joan. You know my number and Instagram handle. Feel free to reach out to me. Yeah. Amy, do you always float? Yes, I do. I won't say floating is for everyone or always right, but it is my preference. I think it's a lot faster and I have devised ways of making sure that my quilts still stay square and flat, but it's a time saver to float. Northern Sue, do you ever switch out your leaders for smaller ones if you're working on a smaller project such as these? No, I don't, Sue, and I can see some advantages to that. I honestly can, but I only have the big leaders, so I'm stuck with it. Okay. I will tell you a bit about my thread, and I'll get started basting, and then we'll talk about the quilt on the wall behind me. I see that I should have been um, pulling out my little air compressor and cleaning the lint really thoroughly off my machine before this morning, but I didn't because this is live and unscripted. I'm going to base the center one first. The thread I have loaded is, you won't be able to see it on the side of the machine. I'm using Isocore brand and it's, well, you can kind of see it, not really. Um, it's an Isocord brand, we're on this camera, and it's 100% polyester, which I love. I've got the same thread in the top and bottom right now. I always try to do very similar, at least, threads in the top and bottom. And it's a 40 weight, but it's fairly fine. Um, has a little bit of gloss to it. I love the 100% poly because it's low lint and it's really strong. So it lends itself to high speed stitching 
on a long arm. The thread color I'm using, the number is 0181, and it's a light silvery taupey kind of gray. It is my new favorite color because it blends ridiculously well with everything. Like I've even used it on quilts that have white backgrounds because it just looks like a shadow. And you'll see that on some of these white borders as I quilt them today. So it's my new neutral that I'm just loving. So to base these little quilts, I always based my projects around the outer edge, you know, within the quarter inch seam allowance that will fall within the binding. But because these quilts are so small, I feel like it's quite important that you get it really squared up. So there's a couple ways of doing that. For me, my machine has a magnetic channel lock. So I have now got the vertical one on. And so I know that my machine is stitching in a perfectly vertical line and I'm literally adjusting my little quilt to be straight on that stitching. If you don't have that, then you might, there's a couple ways you can approach it, but one would be to use a larger square ruler and help that to get your corners be exactly 90 degrees and pin it in place. Like a quarter inch of being off on this quilt will really show. And if you quilt up one side and down the other, you know, you're apt to get a little twist going on. So I think it's quite important that you spend a minute or two getting these little minis squared up because it really shows if they're off a bit. So if you have channel locks, that is certainly the easiest way. And I'm also doing it, you know, visually. So I'm going to go ahead and finish basting this one and baste the pink one. And while I do that, I will talk about the quilt behind me. I certainly grew up making traditional scrappy quilts with my mom, making quilts with whatever you have. And I do still make quite a few quilts, so I always have overflowing scrap bins. Always, always, always. And I love flying geese. So I got this bright idea of why don't I make geese out of scraps and wouldn't it be fun to kind of ombre them? So the they're very much crazy quilt style um, scrappy in other words i just stitched pieces together of all sizes shapes and sizes and then cut them into my flying geese shapes so that's how the color portions worked out and then for the for the low volumes again i just used all kinds of scrappy stuff and within that, I also went scrappy with the piecing. So some of them are little four patches. Some of them um, are half square triangles. And I just, I chose kind of my channel of shades and colors, which is pale yellows and taupes and creams. And then I just played. And what you see is what resulted. And I should insert here, I've basted an awful lot of quilts over the years. So I'm kind of winging this, shifting it, touching it up, moving it with my fingertips. If you don't feel comfortable doing that, by all means, take the time to pin. I pinned for the first, you know, several hundred quilts. Um, but over time, I have learned to just do it as I go. The little squares in this are one inch, by the way, just to give you an idea of the scale. Okay, those two are basted. Um, I had pre-decided, I think I'm gonna quilt the third one with a different color of thread, more a caramely color of thread, but I think I'm gonna go ahead and baste it because remember, this basting stitch is not going to show anywhere anyways, and that will just hold it in place. And then I know that part's done. So again, I am using my channel lock. So I've got a perfectly straight horizontal line stitching right now and I'm literally adjusting my quilt to line up with the stitching. 
And then when I come down the side, I've got that vertical lock on. If you have channel locks, you are a lucky quilter. Not everyone has them, I know, but I sure value mine. This little one has quite a lot of give because there are so many seams in it. I am quite easily able to manipulate it to form my square edges. Perfect. There we are. All three basted. All right. I knew there was a small problem with this quilting and I've discovered what it is. I didn't have my glasses on. I usually take them off at the beginning because they glare so badly when I'm doing the introduction. Okay, we are gonna get started on the quilting. Um, as I do, I would love if you would like and subscribe and comment. And please, please, please share this episode with your friends who you think would benefit from some of the skills that I'm showing. Um, some of the quilting that I'm doing on these today, in fact, quite a bit of it, is going to be done with a ruler. So I am putting, which camera are we on this one? I'm putting my ruler plate on. Most long arms have, or you can find, an attachment like this. And it's really essential for a ruler because the nose of your machine is only so wide and a ruler on that will not be stable. It will be wobbly. It's not perfectly flat either. So this provides basically a small table surface. They attach in different ways. Mine is just attached with a tight spring. All the threads out from under it, like so. And now I've got a table under there. And now I can use my ruler and it's stable. I'm pushing on it and it's not moving. It's nice and stable. Let's do the green one first. Um, do we have a few questions? All right, straight on camera, yeah? <laughs> See, there's the glare again. Boy, glasses are just my nemesis, I tell you. Pilar, is your backing fabric loaded on the backing leader? I noticed you didn't feed it directly under the belly bar. Good question. Honestly, Pilar, I'm only really familiar with my own machine, and I've always loaded it this way since I was first shown or watched YouTube videos of how to load, is going over the belly bar, and my backing rail is underneath that. I have talked to students who have different brands of machines and learned a different way of loading so that it came under the belly bar. And we were actually able to work through that so that they could load more similarly to how I do. One of the reasons that I love loading over the belly bar with just one layer and not having a roll here, when I do larger quilts, I have magnetic bars that I put on the front to stabilize this front edge. And if you have a roll up on here, that might have multiple layers, that does not work well. So explore with other people that own your brand and machine or maybe even load your quilts in different ways. I love just going one layer right over that belly bar because then my magnets always hold. Hope that answers the question. Shelby, how do you hang your quilts on the wall? Oh, it's high tech, thumbtacks. <laughs> it's probably not the best way, but I'll be 100% honest. When we've got cameras in different angles, the quilt behind me is actually not hung straight we literally shifted it so that it looked straight on the screen that you're seeing. So that's why thumbtacks are so handy for us because we can do whatever we need to with that quilt. I don't know if it's the best way, but it's the way we chose. I missed that last one, Dave, I'm sorry. Amy, do you have the magnets on the front bar? I don't, Amy, because this the edge of my quilt is right here in front of me. It's all four sides are perfectly stabilized, so I'm not even using the magnets today. Sue, what is the other small square on your ruler base for? Um, well, one square is to go over the, the base plate that's under my needle. So that's what the one hole is for. Okay, we're gonna pull the other camera over to it. This square here, and I don't know. Good question. I'll ask Gamble that one, or I'll YouTube it. Okay, that all the questions? More questions. That's it. Okay, let's get quilting. Glasses, must have glasses for stitching. I'm just gonna think for a second and, ta and think about 
my quilting path and what I want to quilt in here. I think I'm going to do, I'm just going to clean out a little bit of this lint with a pin. Because I'm afraid that's going to really show on camera and I love that. Um, I think that I'm going to do a small continuous curve on the little nine patches. At least on this green one. If someone else has a bright idea for the pink one, let me know. Actually, I'm going to start in this corner. Let me see if I thought this through correctly. We'll soon know. Okay, hang on a sec. My thread is fraying just a little bit. I must have the bobbin caught underneath. I have learned when something doesn't feel quite right to just stop and take a minute. And yes, my bobbin is doing funky things. So I'm just going to unwind a couple feet and trim it. It's like stripping almost where the ply is not together smoothly. And that could have happened just from putting the ruler on and, and pulling it through underneath that. It kind of messed up the smoothness of the thread. It's worth taking a second and re-threading because it positively will not stitch nicely if that's happening. Okay, I'm just going to start and if my thread path doesn't work beautifully, we'll do it different on the next one. And you may notice I don't have my side stretchers on. I certainly could take the time to do that. I feel like with this small of a project, they're not going anywhere. And also I'm starting with the middle one so that it does not push to one side or the other. I'm pausing for just a second. I had a 13 stitches to the inch length on and I'm bumping that up to 15 just because I'm doing such tiny curves that I feel like, I don't know, the shorter stitch length just looks smoother. I'm not sure how well you guys can see this. It is certainly difficult to see on these dark fabrics. It's not a bad stitching path. I had to retrace the top edge, but that's not too bad. seems like each quilter has their own preference for doing these curves. Some prefer to go point to point to point. I quite like doing the long undulating curve. I will say when I'm stitching this curve, my where I'm looking is always out in front where my needle is. So the point of that curve that I'm trying to go through, of course while I'm talking I forgot the crossways ones, right here as I go through that point I'm always looking at the next point. So here, here's my needle, I'll be looking at that point and as soon as my needle gets there I'll be looking at the next point. So I'm seldom watching where my needle actually is. I'm watching where I want to go. Now I'm just thinking if I want to do a border treatment at the same time. 
thinking, thinking. I think I will come back and do the border later. So that's one little row. I would love to hear if someone else has a fun idea for what to quilt in the pink one. I kind of like to do a little bit different treatments on two quilts that are so similar. And I would love to hear some ideas. I'm definitely happy with the shorter stitch length. It makes a smoother looking curve. When you're doing such small stitching, that's important. If you have a longer stitch length, it looks a bit square cornered. that I'm using, by the way, is made by A1, which is a long arm machine brand. And it is their ruler. Um, it's nine inches long. It's the first straight ruler I ever bought for long arming. And also the last one, because I love it. Um, what I like most about it is the handle that's on it. I like being able to grip my ruler in a variety of ways. So I'm sure there are other brands of rulers that have other ways of gripping which are probably equally satisfactory. But I certainly prefer this over just a flat ruler. And I'll show you what I mean. See how I'm able to grip it when I'm stitching above the ruler? In one way. And then when I turn the ruler, I can grip it in a totally other way. It gives me flexibility in the angles of my ruler. And when you're doing a lot of ruler work on a large quilt, it really makes a difference in the fatigue level of your hand. Instead of just always pushing down on a flat ruler, you're able to grip it in a variety of ways. So I love a ruler with a handle. And there is a link um, in the show notes on the YouTube channel. I'll have to think about where to put that on Facebook. But on the YouTube channel, there's a link in the show notes to a lot of my favorite tools, including that ruler. I'll go ahead and... I will go ahead and finish all these little green inner squares and then I'll stop for a minute and we'll talk about what to quilt on the pink one. Or in fact, if you have any great ideas for the border, for the sashing in either of them, I'm open to ideas. Clip my thread tails.
forgotten to put music on. Boy, we've gotten out of the groove in such a short period of time. The music, by the way, is our good friend Dan Unger. And he has graciously allowed us to use his wonderful, relaxing guitar music. So we appreciate that. Thanks, Dan. I had to stop and think a minute. Now, where am I going next? <laughs> Hope not heavy breathing in your ear while I concentrate on these little bitty 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 curves. And see, I wasn't paying attention there. I usually just stitch right across the top. Oh well, either way works. And you can see as I'm working that both for stopping and starting, I'm not tying and burying my thread knots within the layers. I'm just going ahead and doing five or six really close lock stitches at my beginnings and ends. Here's what I mean by lock stitches. Just over the space of a sixteenth of an inch. I'm just taking stitch, 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 tightly spaced together, and then I pull up that bobbin thread right to the surface and trim right next to the quilt. And it's that simple. And I have totally gotten out of my groove of just running across this whole row. Clearly, I need more practice talking and quilting. Just a little bit of lint on there. Just clean that off a second. There we go. Let's take a mini coffee break and have some discussion. I'll put my needle back over. Okay. What are your thoughts regarding what I should quilt on the pink quilt? I quite love the little the little uh, continuous curves though. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Producer. Bye to Anne. According to Gamble, the opening was to view stitches on the underside to check tension. Ah, that actually makes really good sense because a lot of machines, the computerized machines, the higher end machines have an under, um, under machine camera. So you can see the stitch quality. That makes total sense. Beverly, I missed your visit to Rosalia a couple of weeks ago. Will you be doing any other appearances locally this summer? Um, I did one just the other day at the Quilting Bee, which is a local quilt shop, but now that's done too. So I'm not aware of any, Beverly. I'm wondering where you're at and let's maybe talk and see what we could do. So feel free to reach out to me. If any of you want to, my email is info at stitchedbysusan.com. Super easy. 
Okay, more comments. Marilyn, the smallest stitch length I have on my gamel is 12. How do you get smaller stitches? I'm curious, Marilyn. This is kind of a bigger topic. I won't delve too deeply in, but my machine before this one also only went to 12 stitches per inch, but it was like an electronic um, impulse that controlled that stitch length. And I was able to work in my settings. So I would reach out to someone at Gamel. I was able to work in my settings and kind of do a tricky little workaround in there that allowed me to achieve 15 to the inch, even when it said 12. You can reach out to me if you want to know more about that too, because I can tell you how to do that. Diane, there is a files area on your Facebook page where you can put your favorite notions. Uh, yes, links. Great. Yep, I will do that, Diane. Give me just a smidge of time because I'm a one-woman show here. But yes, I will try and get those up quickly. Okay, other comments? Amanda, good straight line X's or orange peel through the middle of the squares. I did think about straight line X's, but there's actually five lines in each direction. And I thought that was quite a bit of quilting for such a little area. But we might explore that on our on our plexiglass sheet. Diane, I do hearts in the pink one. Even in the big squares, do you think? Maybe in the little sashing bits. Diane, can you do little shamrocks and loops in the white border and sashing in the green one? Great minds think alike. I was already thinking of shamrocks. At least in the little um, cornerstones, there's actually a little clover leaf in there. So I can actually quilt that little clover leaf. So, yeah. Got to get a sip in. So I do like the idea of X's. We'll, we'll explore that. Okay, what's the most efficient way to do these borders? Great question. I just, I just am not positive. I'm, I'm worried that if I do too much quilting, it's just going to be, you know, too intricate of a design is going to look like too much on this little bitty quilt. So I'm thinking the sashing areas, I may literally just quilt a wavy line and then do the shamrock in the little cornerstones. What do you guys think of that? I don't want to stop and start for each section either. You know, let's give this a try. Let's start from the bottom. I just had another idea. Hang on a sec. Let me get one of my trusty little rulers and see if I can make this idea happen. Bear with me a moment. Yeah, did we mention this is live and unscripted? I'm just wondering if I could do, I'm going to pull Lucy off and I'm going to pull up my plexiglass board and show you guys what I'm thinking. And then I'll try and find a ruler the right size. This, by the way, is how I try out designs. You guys will love this if you haven't seen it before. Remove all the things. Okay, so this is a plexiglass sheet. It's an eighth of an inch thick. And I use these to try out designs because I can lay it right on top of my quilting surface and try things out. And I just have a scrunchy old piece of batting for my eraser and a dry erase marker. Um, so that enables me to try things out sort of with no commitment. So the little shamrocks we've already thought of, right? I think those are great in there. But what about in these areas if I did a loop like this? One going one way and one going the other. I think that would be just about right. I like that. So while we've got our plexi out, let's have a peek at our heart quilt. I gotta say I'm not loving the idea of quilting just a heart in here. Although that would certainly qualify as less quilting, wouldn't it? Hang on one sec. No, that's not how I did it. It's probably too many layers. Yep. And then the other idea someone had was cross hatching. But if I do all the squares, there's quite a few lines and quite a bit of backtracking. Or if I do half as much. Hmm. Mr. Producer is saying hearts are better. Hearts are better. 
So maybe that's what I should do. Fill, do a kind of whimsical heart and they could be slightly different in each one too. What do you guys think? Be happy to take a vote on that. Hearts or something that lines up with the piecing. Okay, enough thinking about that one. Let's find a ruler that will work on our little green quilt for curves. It's a pretty small ruler, quite honestly, that I'm needing. So let me root through my bags. Sorry if you're hearing crunchy plastic in the microphone too. I know I'm a very, very noisy person. Let's see. Um, I think that one will work. That's the ruler. Let's give this a whirl. I feel like I should be able to go up one side and down the other and do one whole strip of sashing, perhaps. And I see that this ruler is a little bit large. Do I even have a smaller one? I don't. Okay, so this one it is. I'll just adjust it a little bit as I'm stitching. I'm gonna see how many of these I can do without breaking thread. This is fiddly stuff on such a little quilt, but you know what? It's just not that big, so it's okay. It's gonna look cute, tell you what. Mr. Producer, because he knows all the lingo, is asking me if this is edge to edge or custom. And this is definitely custom. And just while I'm here, I'm going to stitch that one intersection. And then I'll do the other side of that little cornerstone on my way down. Oh, I got a little kind of knob there. I wonder what that was. That sometimes happens, by the way, when you've got a bulky seam allowance and your ruler is resting on it. It might just be my machine. But it's really difficult to avoid ever having those little wobbles. They just happen. But I think in the scheme of things, we'll be okay with this one. Going slow is key. Don't rush it. And sometimes doing tiny work like this is more time consuming than the bigger, the bigger items. Just because it's fiddly. You know, you got to get your fingers and your hand out of the way and all of that. So again, I'm going to watch that I've got all four sides of this little cornerstone quilted. And I actually think I'm not going to quilt anything in that cornerstone. What do you guys think of that? It's really small. And I would end up backtracking quite a bit in order to do it. So in many ways, I'm using the same type of um, continuous path that I used for my little curves in the squares. Can you see that? So I, I'm doing a horizontal line of these um, half circles. And then every time I cross a vertical bar, I'm doing that bar too. Does that make sense? So when I come to the end, hopefully, if I didn't miss any, I'll have caught all this sashing in one pass.
No, I do need to get that in. Whoops. I knew I was pausing for a reason. And there was my first goof. Do you see that? I missed that one horizontal bar. But I won't sweat it. I'll just come back and catch it in a minute. better actually to do it when I'm doing the next vertical row. I don't know if you guys are getting any sense out of what I'm saying. I'm just kind of thinking out loud here. That's how I work. And I do love puzzles, so it just gives me joy <laughs> to fiddle around with these quilting paths and think, how could I do that more efficiently? That's just how my brain works. I'm sorry if my hands or arms are in your way of seeing, but there are just limited ways to be grabbing these rulers and holding them in place. And I just have to use the way that I can hang on to it the most firmly. There are any number of rulers that would do this. I know that there are concave curves, for example, which might be easier to be stitching the inside of a curve instead of the outside of a ruler. But this is what I have that's the right size, so that's what I'm using. But you might experiment if you have other rulers. In your toolbox, you might experiment. Mr. Producer is telling me I sound like Bob Ross. We'll just put a happy little curve right here. It's your quilt. You just experiment. Yeah, sound familiar? Okay, so that's all the inner parts of the green one. I'm not sure what I want to do in that outer border. I mean, shamrocks would be awfully cute. Can I freehand them in there without, you know, much practice? Let's have a look. Let's bring out our plexi border, our plexi um, sheet again. I will put my little curved rulers away because I think I'm done with them. Okay. You know, could we, for example, just start with the three sided ones are quite easy to quilt, the four sided ones are harder. What do you guys think? Can you see it even? That's pretty dang tiny. Tiny and also time consuming. So let's make an executive decision here. Let's put a little shamrock in each corner of the white and let's do a wavy line between. That's what I'm going to do. Sometimes that just does influence the decisions, you know, how much time it takes. I don't want to spend 30 minutes. Um, doing a small border on, you know, such a tiny quilt. But let's put a shamrock in the corner here.
No, hang on a second. I'm right at the front limit of my long arm rail, which is kind of funny because I basted down there, didn't I? Oh, because I put the ruler plate on. Here I am thinking out loud again. When I put the ruler plate on, I can't stitch quite as far forward to this belly bar. So right here, my ruler was bumping up against the edge underneath and I could feel that. So there's my little shamrock. Do I love that little shamrock? Mm, not sure. But I do love trying new things, so I'm going to be happy with that little shamrock. And again, just a few lock stitches, and we'll call that done. All right, let's do a quick pan over it. Do they look recognizably like shamrocks? I'm really happy with the little curvy lines. I like those a lot. And it kind of echoes the continuous curve that's in the smaller squares as well. So I'm happy with that. Good. One done. Several to go. <laughs> okay. If we're going to quilt hearts, let's think this through. I think I have to start a fresh thread for each one of those. We've got pink thread on the back. I'm just thinking this one has very fine sashing. It's just over half an inch wide. So I'm wondering if I should go ahead and put pink thread on and just be stitching in the ditch and doing hearts and not actually stitch within these borders. And I think I'll do that. I'll go ahead and put something in the outside border first. Ah, uh, yes, I think that's what I'll do. Let's hear some comments. Let me get a sip of coffee and then we'll do that outside border. Do you want to put me on the main camera? And I am staying back with my coffee so I don't slouch from the quilt. Okay, any comments? I shall move Lucy a little bit. There we go. Hearts. Judy, she votes for hearts. Charlene votes for offset hearts. Hearts. Wow, you guys are, yeah. Vote straight lines slash half. I'm not sure what you mean by the half. Barbara votes hearts. Do you talk to yourself out loud when you are alone? I do. Uh, yes, I do. Full confession. <laughs> Joan, I stepped away for a minute and missed it. Was the circle an actual ruler or did Susan improvise with something else? I did use an actual ruler on those longer curves. I thought about winging it, but again, when you're working on something so small, people do tend to be close up looking at it, right? So I found the best ruler I had, right size, and went with it. Regina, hearts where point is in the corner of the block. Okay, I'll try that. Yep. Joan, would you do an all over freehand design on something so small? Maybe. <laughs> I don't usually, Joan, you know, because I kind of want to play up those little areas. And I do quite a few of these for Laura, and they're kind of special. So I do put a little time into each one. But you certainly could. You certainly could. Is that it? All right. Let's get out our plexi sheet again and let's explore hearts turned in different directions like with the points in the corner see what that looks like honestly that looks fine so why don't I do hearts in all kinds of ways oh, 
Yeah, I'm just I'm just thinking as I look at these hearts and I'm thinking, you know, how can I not have to stop and start thread necessarily for each one? All that sort of thing. Okay, here's a question apparently. Joan, does Susan do any exercises or stretching to eliminate the forward neck syndrome? Susan does. When I'm quilting on my own, I'm pretty conscious of, um, like I allow my household tasks to interrupt my quilting. So in other words, I'll be doing laundry at the same time and I'll stop and go do something that requires me to lift my head up, look further out, do other things and move. And when I'm doing something that's really intense, like bubbles or some small fill, I will purposely set an alarm clock and make myself take breaks and do shoulder rolls and stretches. Because yes, if you put in a day of quilting and you're doing this all day long, you'll feel that in a hurry and it's not pleasant. Okay, I have second guessed myself on the thread changing. I'm going to leave the thread as is. And we're going to do one square and see what we think of it. And I will take you guys' opinions into account. But what I'm leaning toward now is stitching around the ditch of each square and then dropping a heart in with the same um, thread without breaking thread. I do not know why I started in a middle one because I am too busy talking to you guys. Watch this. Charlene, you asked if I talk to myself when I'm by myself. I do. Sometimes you just have to talk a thing out. Sometimes you just do. So I feel like I can drop in the hearts like that and they don't look too terribly um, like a leaf. They're clearly a heart. So that will enable me to use the same amount of thread passes, thread breaks that I had on the green one, which is one per row. And I'm okay with that. Except it does put me in the same corner with each one, doesn't it? We'll come back to that one. The truth is, I can stop at any corner and drop that heart in. And I'm going to do this in all directions so that the quilt does not become directional. And I'm purposely twisting the little ribbon so that I don't have to worry about exactly backtracking. And I'm just going to travel and put my heart in a different way in this one. I'm happy with that. Yes, and that covers all the edges. Perfect. I'm a happy camper. So now the trick is to pay a little bit of attention and try to randomize the directions in which these hearts are pointing. We have not done the top right corner yet. Top right to me, not sure what it is to you. So I will do that next. Keep grabbing the ruler part in my hand instead of the handle part. What shall we do next? We're going to do lower left again.
try this on for size. Just going right into the next row. Since I'm varying the corners I'm dropping the heart from. And I do realize I missed stitching in the ditch of a couple of those cornerstones on the first row. So I will go back and catch those. I do think it's important to have the consistency throughout. So I did get two that were similarly pointing beside each other. I was watching the row below and got it the same as the one beside, but that's okay. Each one is still going to be a little different because they're each being quilted independently, so I'm okay with that. And if you were perhaps not comfortable quilting hearts in any direction, it would be a good time to make yourself a little, even a little template and chalk or use an air erasable marker to just draw them into place. So you have a guideline. My favorite way to make a little quilting motif if I want to trace around one is just out of a piece of um, cardboard like a, a file, you know, an office file. It's lightweight, it's easy to cut, super easy to make a little um, template that you can just trace around. Okay, I know there are still a couple of places that I did not do that little tiny um, cornerstone on all four sides. I will come back and catch those later, but probably not on camera. See, there's a couple down here. But let's go ahead and do a little border. And I think I'm going to do the same little wavy line just because it's easy. Um, and because this is such a slim little border on this one. But it's difficult to start the wavy line and make it connect without showing. So I am going to start with a little heart in the one corner. Perfect. All right.
right. And what I do to remind myself, you guys, is I just grab a couple of my pins. Because this sometimes happens on a large quilt too. You know, maybe you've changed thread color and moved on and you see, oh, there's a detail I missed. I drop a pin in like this and I keep it horizontal so that if I'm rolling up a whole quilt, it rolls up in it perfectly safely, but it's easy to find when you need to come back and fix it. All right, I'm going to change thread because we're gonna work on this one over here and just see how it just has richer, deeper colors. And there's nothing wrong with this thread that I'm sewing with now, but it's the very lightest shade that's in the quilt. And I like doing something different than the others and I think a richer color will be pretty. So I'm gonna put in kind of a caramel colored thread. So if you have any questions, now's a great time to type them in while I change out my bobbin and my top thread. And I am using the same thread, top and bottom. It's Isocord 100% Poly in a 40 weight. And I always try and use the same or a very close color, top and bottom, as well. While I'm changing out the thread too, it's a great time to like and subscribe to the channel. And if you click on the little bell, you will get notifications as well whenever I'm going live. These live and unscripted episodes are scheduled for the first and third Friday of each month. Each project is different. Each project is very casual and it is in real time. So you get to see the whole thing. And as you're seeing today, you're really getting to see some of my thought processes and even have some input into what I'm quilting on these projects. I joke that I've loved show and tell ever since kindergarten and I'm still showing and telling. I just can't help myself. So I've just knotted my new top thread and I'm just pulling it through. I've unthreaded it from my needle because of course that knot won't pull through the needle. So I pull it through till I grasp the knot, snip behind it, and that's my new thread loaded. There we go, all set. I get asked often, don't you check your bobbin tension with every change? And the truth is I don't. I do have a TOA gauge and I kind of do spot checks. It's like the border crossing. You've been randomly chosen for a bobbin tension check. Um, but mostly I, I know my machine pretty, pretty well. And I watch, I'm watching the stitch formation. I'm even watching the thread as it's feeding through the loops. If there's an issue in the threading, I'll see it. It will be vibrating or bobbling. And those types of things I'll notice. If the thread is laying on the top of my stitching differently than it should be, I'll see that and I'll stop and I'll go and check. But generally speaking, when all those things are working smoothly, I just keep on sewing. So you're just seeing me put in a bobbin and go. But the truth is sometimes, some days, you know, when you're pulling that long thread through, it does pop out of a tension disc or something. But I can actually see that at this end in the results that I'm getting. And then I stop and go and pursue that. For this little quilt, I thought I would go more simple. I'm just going to quilt diagonal lines. And initially I thought I would do a cross hatch. And then I decided that's kind of busy unless I make it an inch or an inch and a half. And that's kind of big. So I've decided that I'm going to do just one angled line. So it's kind of a variation on parallel lines, but it's going to be diagonal instead of straight. Do I know for sure how that's going to work when the mini is done and sort of pulls up? No, I don't because I haven't done it before. So we're going to experiment together. So what I'm going to do is start on one side and do kind of one half of it and see how it looks, see if I'm pleased with it and go from there. And I'm going to use the piecing as my guide because there are, there are so many seams and they're regular, if that makes sense. There are squares in the piecing. So I'm just going to use those intersection points as my guide for where to place my ruler. And at this moment, I think I am going to keep them on the big side. And that way, if I decide, no, I think a cross hatch will look better, I don't have to undo anything. I can just drop in the lines going in the other diagonal. Repetitive parallel lines 
Like if you've ever been a knitter, for example, you'll know that like the ribbing on a sweater, you know how that kind of pulls in and pulls together? Parallel lines can do the same thing. So that's my worry is that if I only put parallel lines in one direction, that it's going to make the quilt pull into an odd shape. I have to look carefully to be sure where the edges of my little blocks are. So I'm getting the right line here. Again, why don't you guys chime in? Do you think I should just put another line between each of these or should I cross hatch? Should I cross hatch this size or cross hatch smaller? These are all options. And all my traveling, I'm just doing kind of on my basting line, which is well within the seam allowance on the edge of the quilt. So it doesn't matter if it's perfectly straight. I definitely don't think this is enough quilting at this point. So I've either got to do more or, you know, closer together or the other direction as well. I'm just sitting looking at it. Boats are coming in as crosshatch, Dave is saying. I think you guys are right. So let's start quilting in the other direction at this size. And then our next step will be to determine if we want to do a smaller one. The beauty of doing a crosshatch is that you can really get efficient with your stitching, not even have to travel very often. You can just go round and round and round and round, filling in all those lines, which I quite love. Again, got to make sure I'm at the right, the right intersections that I'm aiming at with my ruler. easy to get confused. Okay, how are we feeling about this? Is this enough or is this too large of a scale? I've got an opinion formed already. I'm curious what you guys think though. While I'm getting this done, I almost forgot to tell you. Um, in my posts about today and in my newsletter, I mentioned that I wasn't sure, I wasn't positive which quilt I was going to be working on because I was waiting for one to come in the mail. It did not come in time. And so we're doing this, the little three minis, which I'm 100% happy with. But that other quilt that is coming has to be completed in a hurry. So what I'm currently thinking is that either tomorrow afternoon or Sunday afternoon, I'm going to go live again with that project. So this will be kind of an unscheduled um, little bonus one. So I don't know how to tell you for sure what it will be. I'll try and post about it on social media, but I would check back. Um, what shall we say, Dave? Three o'clock Pacific time? So it may be tomorrow and it may be Sunday, depending on when it actually arrives in the mail. So that will just be a little bonus, live and unscripted. Uh, 
I think that's all at the larger size. What do you guys think? I'll get my coffee cup in hand and you give me some feedback on if you think that is small enough, tight enough, or if I should do another whole set. Interesting. One of those lines looks very crooked and I went point to point, I feel like on the squares. I'm just looking at the points. I hit the points, but it's a little wonky looking. Okay. Mr. Producer is saying you can't really see. So let me break thread here for a second and I'll pan over it. So keep in mind, scale wise, this quilt is a little less than 12 inches, about 11 and a half inches by 17. Okay. So that gives you an idea of the scale. So is that enough cross hatching? Should I do a secondary batch, which would make it then half sized? Everyone's saying it's good. Huh? See, I think it needs another, another row. Any way to see the whole thing. Can we do the camera that's on my left? And I'll, I'll put my ruler out there and I'll get my hand out here so you guys can. Okay, bear with us a minute. Dave is just moving a camera and he's going to be, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going to hold the camera and pan over it. So just give us a couple seconds while we switch cameras on the streaming software and then you can see the whole thing. And I'm coming around to your way of thinking that we actually have enough simply because it is small. And if you put too much stitching in, it just pulls up into a hard little something, something. So what do you think? There's my hand for size. That gives you an idea of the scale. They're about, oh, an inch and a half, just a little under an inch and a half for each quilted square. So he's going to go ahead and pan over the whole thing while he's here. And of course, funny story, the little bits that I need to go back and redo on the pink one, I changed my thread. So now I have to change thread again to go back and do them. But you know, live and learn. Sorry. <laughs> there we go. You got a nice view of my hand. Sorry about that. I'm quite happy with that little continuous curve. I love that a whole lot. Cool. Ah, so funny. We're always experimenting, right? And we're crazy. Okay, so I think we will call that one good. Um, I'm debating that one wobbly line. I'm really debating going back and redoing that. I think I probably will, and I don't think I'll do it on camera. I will, however, change my thread for a second, redo the bits on this pink one while you guys ask me any questions, okay? And let's see, let me mention again the bonus Live and Unscripted that's coming up this week. So I've got a quilt coming in the mail that's got a short turnaround on it, and I'll give more details about it um, in the show. And I had hoped it would be here for today's Live and Unscripted episode, but it wasn't. So I do have to do it anyway this weekend. So I thought, why not? Since, since we've been gone for such a long time and you guys have been so gracious and patient about it, I thought we'll just do another bonus episode. So if it comes in the mail tomorrow morning, that's going to be tomorrow at 3 o'clock Pacific time. And if it comes in the mail a little later, it's going to be Sunday at 3 o'clock p.m. Pacific time. So feel free to tune in for that. It's a smallish quilt. I think it's about 48 inches square, so it won't be a long episode. But it'll give you time to get your little quilting fix in. So I am just going to load my thread and then I'm going to move Lucy. You guys can then chime in with any questions or comments you've got and then I think we'll end today's episode and then I'll come back and do these little fixes. Um, I was just going to move Lucy around. So you guys probably, I don't think it shows on camera, but this line right here has quite a, a curve in it. And I'm just a few threads off the point, but I think I'm going to go a few threads off it the other side and then the line will read more straight. Okay, that's our panning. Any questions coming in? Any comments? Any thoughts? I'll take the glasses off and they don't glare so badly. Diane, I love heavy quilting, but there's enough on the last quilt. I wouldn't add more. I value that. If you're a person that leans toward 
more dense quilting, then I value that, that opinion that that's, you know, just the right amount. Regina, what is the size of the flying geese block from the quilt behind you? Oh, very good question. Well, it's 10 inches from the bottom to the point, right? Because I've got a nine inch ruler and it, it's, it's 10 here as well. So, so then 20 all the way down here. And I don't know that you can see in the picture, but the way I pieced it was I just cobbled my scraps together and then I cut four triangles that are like this. And then there's one here and one here. Can you see that? So that's how I built it. This is just cobbled together. This one's just cobbled together. The seams go every which way in there. And then I just put those four triangles together to make these. That's it. Okay, any more questions about today's? Um, Mr. Producer is just looking for something, so I'll do my little rundown spiel as we go. I'd love if you'd like and subscribe and especially share this channel with your friends that you think would enjoy this. It really helps us to get visibility. And I am really here to just show and tell, as I said earlier. I love showing and telling, and I love making um, kind of your everyday quilts approachable and easy and taking the mystery out of some of the decisions and choices that have to be made. So I welcome you to just come into my studio and tune in. You know, as I'm working on these projects, they're different projects every time. It's really subject to the projects that are coming to me from my clients. But it's fun to just be able to show you the process in real time, you know, as I'm walking through it. So like and subscribe. Um, you can find me again on my podcast. It's called Measure Twice, Cut Once. Easy to find that, podcast.stitchedbysusan.com. A lot of them are interview-based, so talking with other crafters and quilters. Some of them in the upcoming, um, the next few are going to be just me talking a little more about um, kind of the behind-the-scenes process and, and a little bit more business-related as well. So that's the podcast. Um, what are you trying to tell me, Dave? Sorry. Oh, okay. Sorry. Question. Joan. Do you know how these little quilts will be used? Actually, I don't, Joan. I know that some of them she has given away. I'm trying to think how many of them I've quilted for Laura over time. Very close to 20, quite a lot. So what she will often do, as in the case of this, um, the rich autumnal colored one, is she makes a full-sized quilt or a lap-sized quilt and then makes it in a mini version. So I don't even know if she converts the pattern herself, if she's just doing it to use up her smaller scraps. I'm not 100% sure. But I do know they're awfully fun to quilt. They're just so so dainty and tiny, and it's just a little project, and I love it. Okay, anything else I have missed, Mr. Producer, sir? He thinks we've got everything. So thanks, thanks everyone for tuning in. It was just so fun to get back in touch with you today. A month is a long absence, but we got a lot done. We saw a lot of family, and that was great too. So more quilting in the future. Um, I hope you'll tune in again. Always these shows are the first and the third Friday of each month at 9 a.m. Pacific time. So I will see you next time. Thanks for watching.